Welcome back to 2K Way Podcast. I'm Peyton, this is my sister Paige, and we talk about true crime and the macabre. This week is a Paige episode, and she has been holding back information from me and will not tell me who she's doing, so I've been like, guessing all week and then she just ignores me and it's been pissing me off well because you've been wrong every single time you've guessed (laughs) every single time (laughs) yeah because you gave me no clues you just said it's a guy and he's a serial killer and I'm like well that's a shit ton of people (laughs) it's a solved case I'm finally giving you a solved no okay it's a solved case (laughs) Thank you for double checking. Well, the very first thing I'm going to say is still technically unsolved, but everything else, everything else is, is, is solved. I promise. I don't like you. So you're going to go, Peyton's going to be on this ride, just like all of you are. If you don't know who this person is, unless I actually do know who it is. And I'll just be like, oh yeah, I know who it is. (laughs) Really fun. I don't know if you will. We'll see. We'll see. All right. <laughs> we'll start, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> okay, fine. So we're going to be talking about the Riverside Prostitute Killer, a.k.a. the Lake Elsinore Killer. Have you heard of them? The Green River Prostitute Killer sounds familiar. No, the Riverside Prostitute Killer <laughs> is actually what there I we said. go. <laughs> This goes back to me not fucking listening to you because I don't. <laughs> not at all. I heard what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Instead of actually listening, you assumed what you heard <laughs> and went with that. Maybe that's what I thought I heard. <laughs> there is a Green River killer. There is, and we will be covering him. But Just this is not, not that guy. Not him. Okay. Not today. No. No, we're talking about the Riverside Prostitute Killer. Okay, are you going to tell me his name? (laughs) In a second. (sighs) God. I love this, seriously. Okay, so I'm just going to dive right in. And I'm going to be taking you back to October 1986. So in a drainage ditch near Riverside, California. So kind of in your backyard. Hey. (laughs) Wait, you said Riverside, California? yeah okay all righty so i'm just gonna go ahead and dive right in but a bit of a warning this guy's uh he's a it's a heavy one yeah he's- any any time that we do any heavy cases we are gonna forewarn you so if yeah. we get to some gruesome stuff just skip ahead a few seconds well you might want to skip ahead quite a bit on this one if you don't like any of the gruesome stuff because i'm diving right into it we we do details here even if they're gross there then there's going to be a lot of details in yep. this one this yep. is we tried to ease you in with ed gein <laughs> if you can be eased in at all with ed with gein. ed gein yeah <laughs> but this guy this is going to be the first like real heavy serial killer here so i'm gonna take you back to october of 1986 so in a drainage, drainage ditch near Riverside, California, uh, sex worker Michelle Yvette Gutierrez, 26, was found dead. She suffered severe trauma to her anal and vaginal areas and multiple stab wounds to her face, chest, and buttocks and ligature marks on her neck indicative of strangulation. She was the first of a string of similar murders over the next few years Although the man convicted of the next murders was never convicted of hers, but he was said to be the one that killed her. And you'll see why with these next murders that I'm going to name off. It's pretty much the same MO, but he was never convicted of her murder. I just wanted to start with hers because she was basically the first. Gotcha. That, that does happen with a lot of cases is like, Mm -hmm. Oh, he, someone will be convicted of x amount but they're not going to be convicted of these certain ones because of reasons like that that happens with a lot of cases yeah well so then i'm going to start with kind of where his conviction kind of started with the who who it started with i should say so next january of 1989 so three years later in lake elsinore california 
sex worker Rhonda Jetmore was working on Main Street waiting for a customer. A man pulled up, introduced himself as Bob, and they agreed to $20 for straight sex. She led him to a nearby vacant residence and requested prepayment. He handed her a bill, but when she shined her flashlight on it, saw that it was just a dollar, like a single dollar. Mm. Before she could do anything, though, he immediately grabbed her by the throat with both of his hands and knocked her to the ground and continued to choke her. She noticed that his belt buckle said Bill. As she was losing air, she remembered that she still had her flashlight in her hand and, like a badass, she hit him in the side of the head. And they began to wrestle. I keep hitting she was him. trying. Yep, she was trying to get away. She was hitting him and he was trying to still wrestle her to the ground. She tried to escape, but then he lost his glasses because he was wearing glasses. He told her that he would let her go if she would help him find his glasses. She shined her light. Um, fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So she shined her light on them. And as he went to get them, she escaped. Good. So she was the survivor. Badass. Seriously. Good job, Rhonda Jetmore. Yeah. On June 28th, 1989. So this was just six months after Rhonda. Question. Is there mm-hmm. a reason why you're going through this order? Yeah. Like instead of, okay. Yeah. Like because just straight like up said, saying murders and then going yep. into the story? Okay. Yep. Okay. Because like I said, there's a backstory but the backstory is going to piss you the fuck off. Oh boy. So this is why I'm going through the murders first, because I want them to get the recognition that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and then go back and you'll see why I started with this. Okay. On June 28th, 1989, six months after Rhonda Jetmore, the body of 28 year old Kimberly Little was found in a rural area near Lake Elsinore. She was a sex worker who also worked on Main Street. Her cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation. She had multiple scratches and bruising on her neck that appeared to be fingernail marks. Her hyoid bone was also fractured, indicating strangulation, along with hemorrhage. There was also hemorrhaging in her scalp, indicative of some kind of blunt force trauma, and abrasions on her arms and other parts of her body consistent with cigarette burns okay among the clothes on her body were socks and a t-shirt that didn't appear to be hers along with a towel draped over her body the evidence they were able to retrieve was a small amount of semen from a vaginal swab hair from the killer's head pubic hair from the killer and carpet fibers and rope fibers we know that it's from the killer's head and his pubic hair because of the trial later on we'll get to that so anytime you hear me say killer's head and we know for a fact it's his well then they can compare hairs so they know right so on december 13th 1989 six months later the body of 23 year old sex worker tina leal was found on a not frequented dirt dirt road in lake elsinore Her official cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation and stab wounds to her heart. There was hemorrhaging in her neck and eyes and abrasions on her neck. All of the injuries that she sustained anti-mortem were injuries to her lip and chin consistent with being hit, a black eye, a cut on her left breast, lacerations to her vaginal area, possibly caused by blunt force and stab wounds to her pubic area. The final wounds before death and consequently leading to her death were four stab wounds to her chest, two of which penetrated her heart. They had also believed that she may have been bound at the wrist and ankles due to redness on both wrists and both ankles. Probably the worst thing though that they had discovered on her was an intact 95 watt light bulb found in her uterus which was inserted through her vagina and cervix it was fully intact 
And it was all yeah. the way in her uterus? In her uterus, yes. Oh my God. Was that yeah. Was that postmortem? It's or could not, they could they not tell? It's not really known. Among her clothes that she had on was a t-shirt that wasn't hers, but she was missing her shoes. The evidence that they found were the killer's hair, carpet fibers, rope fibers, fibers from her tennis shoes, tire tracks consistent with a Yokohama 382 tire and an Armstrong Ultra Track tire. All of this evidence comes into play later. On January 18th, 1990, the posed nude body of 23-year-old sex worker Darla Ferguson was found near a dirt road in the Lake Elsinore area. She was purposely posed with her legs up, exposing her genitalia, and her arms crossed across her, tre- her chest. Her cause of death was, was asphyxiation due to strangulation. Starting at the top of her head and working my way down as far as her injuries, there was hemorrhaging under her scalp consistent with blunt force trauma, hemorrhaging in her eye and in the skin of her lips, her tongue was protruding and bitten between her teeth, indicative of, with asphyxiation, bruising under her jaw bones, possibly due to strangulation or from blunt force trauma, abrasions consistent with fingernail marks on her neck, mm-hmm. bruising on the skin and muscles of her neck, along with hemorrhaging in the thyroid cartilage and ligature marks on her wrists. The evidence that was collected on scene was male DNA from a vaginal swab hair from the killer's head, rope fibers, a paint chip, and tire marks consistent with a Yokohama 382 tire and an Armstrong UltraTac tire. On February 8th, 1990, the nude body of 34-year-old sex worker Carol Miller was found in a grapefruit grove in the High Grove area of Riverside County. Her cause of death was the five stab wounds to her chest, three of which penetrated her heart. She did have signs of asphyxiation as well, hemorrhaging in her eyes, in her eyes, eyelids, lips, and gums. The tissue that attached her upper lip to her gum was torn, which would be consistent with being hit in the face or struggling while being strangled. There were also ligature marks on her wrist, and the only clothing on her was a t-shirt that partially covered her face. The evidence that was found on her was male DNA from a vaginal swab, the killer's head and pubic hair, carpet fibers, rope fibers, paint chips, and tire tracks consistent with a Yokohama 382 tire and an Armstrong Ultra Track tire and a partially eaten grapefruit. She left behind a son. On November 6th, 1990, the posed nude body of 33-year-old sex worker Cheryl Coker was found in a dumpster located in an industrial area of Riverside. Okay, so now we're Now we're posing the bodies. Okay. Yep. She was last seen by her husband on October 30th. Her cause of death was strangulation by some kind of ligature. So it was not by hands this time. Mm. She was more decomposed than the others because she was found almost a full week after she was last seen. Yeah. But they were able to identify hemorrhaging in her eyes and the soft tissue under the ligature mark. The ligature mark was actually so deep that it cut through her skin. She also had bruising on her forearms and on the backs of her legs. For the first time, they found her right breast had been removed Mm post-mortem and found approximately 30 feet away. The evidence they found was a used condom near her feet, the killer's hair, carpet fibers, rope fibers, and shoe prints that were not hers. On December 21st, 1990, the nude body of 27-year-old sex worker Susan Sternfield was found in an enclosure for a dumpster in an industrial area in Riverside. Her cause of death was strangulation. They found hemorrhaging in her eyes, eyelids, and in the muscles of her neck. They found abrasions on her neck and her larynx was fractured. The evidence found with her was male DNA from a vaginal swab, carpet fibers, and rope fibers. On January 19th, 1991, the nude body of 42-year-old sex worker Kathleen Milney, also known as Kathleen Puckett, 
was found adjacent to a dirt dirt road in the Lake Elsinore area. Her sister saw her just the day before. Her cause of death was asphyxiation due to strangulation and obstruction of her airway by a sock shoved in her mouth. There was hemorrhaging in her eyes, mouth, and neck, and a fracture in her larynx. Evidence taken was male DNA from a vaginal swab, carpet fibers, and tire tracks consistent with an Armstrong Ultra Track tire. On July 4th, 1991, the nude body of 37 year old sex worker Sherry Latham was found in a field in the Lake Elsinore area. Her cause of death was strangulation. Her body was in an advanced state of decomposition, so her injuries were harder to identify, but they found hemorrhaging in the muscles of her neck and a fracture in her thyroid cartilage. The evidence they found was strangulation. Right. The evidence they found was carpet fibers, rope fibers, and cat hair. That's new. Yep. On August 16th, 1991, the posed nude body of 27-year-old sex worker Kelly Hammond was found in an alleyway in an industrial area of the city of Corona. Her body was posed face down with her right arm under her abdomen, her left arm bent at the elbow with her palm facing upward, her left leg drawn up to her chest area, and her right leg extended outward, exposing her genitalia. Her cause of death was strangulation, but her toxicology report showed opiates in her system, which con- also contributed to the str- you know, to this asphyxiation. Good Lord. She had lacerations on her forehead, hemorrhaging in her eyes, mouth, and neck, and abrasions on her face. There was a linear injury on the back of her neck and an abrasion on the front of her neck that could have been inflicted with a ligature. She had abrasions on her wrists that were consistent of restraint. Evidence found was male DNA from a vaginal swab, carpet fibers, and cat hair. Kelly Whitecloud, a friend and sex worker, saw Kelly Hammond the day before working on University Avenue in Riverside. Whitecloud later testified that a bluish gray van with gray carpet interior pulled up to her and the man agreed to $20 for sexual services. He took her to McDonald's and bought her food because she had said that she was hungry. Then they argued about where to go because he wanted to go to the orchards and she wanted to go to a hotel room. So she ended up jumping out of the van while it was moving to escape him. So she witnessed the same van stop in front of Kelly Hammond. She tried to yell at her, tell her no, tell her stop, but she didn't hear and Kelly got in the van and that was the last time she was seen. So by this time, the media had stated that only the only people that weren't safe were white women who were prostitutes. Yeah. Then seems like almost out of spite on September 13th, 1991, the posed nude body of 30 year old sex worker, Catherine McDonald was found near a dirt road in a remote location in the Lake Elsinore area. She was the first and only black woman in this whole string of murders. She was found lying on her back with her knees spread apart and her feet together and her arms extended out on either side of her body. Her cause of death was neck compression and multiple sharp force injuries. She had hemorrhaging in her eyes consistent with strangulation. She had abrasions on her neck along with a large laceration that cut through the muscle, trachea, left jugular vein, and left carotid artery. So she had a pretty deep neck wound there. Her right breast was removed post-mortem. She also had stab wound and four lacerations to her genitalia. The evidence found at the scene was male DNA from a vaginal swab, hair from the killer's head, and pubic hair, shoe prints that were not the victims, tire tracks consistent with a Yokohama I'm sorry, Yokohama 382 tire and a Yokohama 371 tire. She was last seen by her daughter just the day before when she said she was going to the store. She was also four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. On October 30th, 1991, the body of 35-year-old sex worker Delia Zamora, also known as Delia Wallace, was found near a freeway interchange in the Riverside County. Her cause of death was strangulation. 
She had hemorrhaging in her eyes, eyelids, and neck. Her neck had abrasions caused by fingernails, and her larynx was completely crushed, which would require an extreme amount of pressure. The evidence they found was male DNA from a vaginal swab and rope fibers. And finally, on December 23rd, 1991, the nude body of 39-year-old sex worker Eleanor Casares was found near a dirt road in Orange Groves. Her cause of death, death was strangulation. She had hemorrhaging in her eyes and eyelids. She had abrasions on her neck, a fracture in her thyroid cartilage, and a fracture and bleeding in her hyoid bone. She had a single stab wound in her chest that also would have been fatal. One of her breasts was removed post-mortem and was 40 feet from her body. The evidence that they found on scene was hair from the killer's head and pubic hair, cat hair, carpet fibers, rope fibers, shoe prints that were not the victims, and tire tracks consistent with the Yokohama 371 tire, Uniroyal Tiger Paw XTM tire, and Dunlop SP32J tire. Her sister had just heard from her that morning. So I really wanted to give you all of the victims that basically fell victim to this man. There were more, but these were the only ones that he was actually convicted for. It spanned from 1986 until finally Eleanor Casares was, was the last one in 1991. Unfortunately, I just, I didn't get the names of all the rest of the women, but there, there was possibly up to 19 to 22 women. This was only 12. Thank you for saying how many that you named because I I wasn't keeping track of numbers. I know. I figured. So this was only 12. Okay. So on January 9th, 1992, at 9.30 p.m., Frank Otra, a motorcycle officer, was patrolling University Avenue in Riverside where almost all of the victims had worked. He saw a gray silver minivan pull up to the side of the road. He saw a sex worker go to the driver's side, but she had seen Otra. So she went up, made contact with the driver, saw Otra, and then just immediately left. So the van drove off and Otra followed. He witnesses the van come to a stop at a stoplight in the straight lane. He wasn't in a turning lane at all. So Otra had pulled up behind him. So without signaling and without being in the right turn lane, the van turned right. So Otra pulled the van over for failure to signal. When he asked for a license and registration, the driver gave him his license, but he said he didn't have his registration with him. The driver was identified as 41-year-old William Bill Lester Suff. Turns out his registration actually expired two years earlier and his license was suspended. They automatically towed the van, which gave them the right to search it which I had also seen where Otra had said that when somebody doesn't have a valid registration, he automatically always tows the vehicle. This wasn't just like a one-time thing. He does that with everything like that. So because they towed it, that gave them the right to automatically search it. They found a parole card with his name on it, a rope, a pellet gun, and a knife with blood and some kind of pink substance on it. He was informed that he was being arrested for a parole violation and possession of the knife. Upon further investigation, they saw that all four of the tires on his van were each a different brand of tire, and all of them matched the tires at all of the crime scenes. The carpet fibers found at the crime scenes matched the carpet in the van. There was also some other fibers that were found on the crime scenes as well that I hadn't mentioned that matched some of the stuff in his van, like the sleeping bag that was found in his van. There were some of those fibers at all the crime scenes, the stuffing in the sleeping bag that was kind of found at the crime scenes. There was a gold pillow, some kind of pillow with a gold case or something like that, that was in his van. Those fibers. Yeah. That makes me uncomfortable. (laughs) Find that found at the crime scenes as well. The same with the rope. All the rope fibers match that rope. His shoe prints also match some of the shoe prints that were found at the crime scene. Some of the different shoes that he had worn. When the blood on the knife was tested, it matched Eleanor Casares. 
the final victim. And the pink substance turned out to be a kind of fatty tissue that also matched Kasari's. On July 28th, 1992. Oh, I should also mention he had a cat. That's why there was Hence cat the hair cat found. The cat hair, yeah. That's why there's cat hair found. So on July 28th, 1992, a grand jury indicts William Suff on 14 murder counts and one count of attempted murder. He was sentenced to death on August 17th, 1995, after a lengthy jury trial, but the jury only deliberated for 10 minutes, and then he was sentenced to death for 12 counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. The attempted murder was the very first one, Rhonda Jetmore. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to Bill Suff. He's quite a fuck. He was born on August 20th, 1950 in Torrance, California. Mm -hmm. He grew up in the Riverside area. So that's why he was very familiar with all of those back roads and, and places. His mother was very cold and very domineering. She was not the mom you wanted growing up. He had four younger siblings who were all very much younger than him. I saw a picture of him and his, all the siblings when they were younger. He was way taller. You could clearly see they were all very much younger than him. Mm. Their father left them and divorced his mother when Bill was a teenager. So this left Bill to kind of take on the role of quote unquote head of the household because his mom didn't give a shit. Basically he took care of his younger siblings and kind of watched after them. His younger siblings. He became father basically. Kind of. Well, and he kind of had to because all of his siblings were troublemakers like the kind that were killing animals type of troublemakers, like killing cats. That's not a good, are are we going to do episodes on his siblings in the future? No, they don't have the record that Bill does. No, they, they turned out not to be killers. They might've been, they might beat people, you know, and have, and steal things, but they didn't kill anybody that we know of. Gotcha. Okay. Other than the animals. Um, but Bill was basically the golden child because he never got in trouble ever throughout school. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like almost the opposite, you know, normally yeah, serial killers start off with the cats. Yeah. Cause not. there's, there's one kind of, um, I think it's called the McDonald triangle where it's basically like, okay, so you it, making a serial killer, like one of the things I think it's like three typical things that you see in serial killers is like they torture small animals when they're young yep they wet the bed Mm -hmm. and they usually end up joining the military yeah like it that's a pretty common theme and there's a lot stuff yeah oh hey hey sorry if i just foreshadowed but yeah (laughs) i mean like there's a lot of there's a lot of tells when it comes to ser- like i think head trauma is a, a big one as well yeah um but yeah okay continue lots of goings on to make a serial killer yeah so he wasn't very extraordinary though in high school he kind of made average grades he was kind of small and a little bit shy but what he actually excelled in was band he was very gifted So while at a football game in high school, he met Terrell. He was three years older than her. She gave him her phone number and they started dating. When he got out of high school, he joined the Air Force. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So when he came back from boot camp, he found out that Terrell had been raped and she was pregnant. So his solution was to get married. Terrell was 16 when they got married because they had to have permission, but she was 16. He was 19 when they got married. I'm just going to say this one, one time. Pregnancy does not mean you have to get married. Nope. It does not. That's not the answer. (laughs) Nope. And also this wasn't the answer. Oh yeah. I'm sure. Apparently without consulting Terrell, he arranged for his mother and stepfather because his mom ended up getting remarried to adopt the baby and told his commanding officer that the baby died not sure how he was able to do that why did he do that i was all part of him now being that controlling person 
okay. in the relationship. And of all people, you want your mother to adopt this baby? Right. You didn't have a great mother growing up and you want her to raise a new baby? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So this was the beginning of him being that controlling, domineering type person in the relationship. So while in the military, he was actually stationed in Texas and he worked as an aide in a pediatric hospital. He was discharged at some point. Don't know why. And it was before the four years was it, was up. Was it an honorable discharge? He said it was, and there's nothing. Saying well, obviously that it wasn't. he's a lying sack of shit. So who knows? But there's nothing saying that it wasn't. So mm. not entirely sure. Okay. But the whole him working in a pediatric hospital makes me uncomfortable. It's gonna piss you off here in just a second. Great. Yep. So I actually watched. Uh, I, yeah, it was a documentary. I found it on YouTube, actually. I was pretty excited. I found one of this guy. Um, you can just look it up. William Suff documentary. It's like 45 minutes long. And they interviewed Terrell, actually. Oh. So from that interview. Terrell's an interesting said, name. I like it. Terrell. T-E-R-Y-L. Oh, I like that. So she, cause she said she still has no idea why he was discharged from the air force. Um, and she had said how upset she was and how horrible it was that he arranged for the baby to be adopted and telling his commanding officer that the baby died. Yeah. Like she was so upset about that. So she said that he was sometimes abusive and she even witnessed him shoot their kitten with a BB gun <sighs> because it wouldn't be quiet. Yeah, he's a real piece of shit. So they ended up having a little boy and then a little girl. Bill became a stay-at-home dad because he couldn't keep a job after he left the military. And Terrell worked. She held down the job. Yeah. So on September 25th, 1973... I'm going to give you Terrell's account of what happened because I found contradicting events, but I'm just going to go ahead and give you what Terrell had said happened. So she said she was at work um, and Bill called her and told her that there was something wrong with their two month old daughter, Dijonay. He hadn't called for help yet, but by the time she got home, she saw that the baby wasn't moving. So she ended up calling for help. By the time a doctor got to the house, she was pronounced dead. Mm. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to her head that also could have been from shaking. And trigger alert, there's more real bad shit. There was also massive internal bleeding in her abdomen, which could have been caused also by shaking. There were bruises that covered almost the entire front of her body, oh my God. including including a human bite mark <sighs> her liver was ruptured in two places by an extreme amount of force from blunt force trauma and she had multiple rib fractures and one of her arms was fractured but they realized that the arm break was a few weeks old there was also a burn mark on one of her feet consistent with a cigarette burn that poor baby went through hell my god both Bill and Terrell were arrested on April 11th, 1974. That was on September 25th, 1973. A few months later is when they were both arrested and then convicted of the murder of their two-month-old daughter, Dijonay. Their four-year-old son was taken away from them from allegations of abuse on him as well. Terrell's conviction ended up getting reversed. So Terrell did go to prison but it was only for like a year or something, I think. Mm. But as soon as she got out of prison, she immediately divorced Bill. Good. And he was sentenced to 70 years in a Texas prison. Okay. Are you having a hard time with the math on that? Because, you know, that was in 1974. I wasn't great at math in school, but I can do, yeah. Yeah, 1974 is when he was convicted and sentenced to prison. 1986 is when the first murder happened. Yeah, that's okay. because he only served 10 years in prison for the murder of his two-month-old 
little baby. He served 10 fucking years Why? of his 70 year sentence because he was a model pris- prisoner. Uh, he was a model prisoner. And he got out in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Of February 1984 is when he was paroled. Now you know why I told you about the murders first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 1984 is when he was paroled. He was on parole for two years. As soon as his parole was over, that's when the first body was found. Jesus Christ. See, yep. okay. You know, you can disagree with me all you want. I don't really care. We're, we're allowed. I'm allowed to have a different opinion. It's not harming anyone. Don't get me wrong. Our system is flawed. Every system is flawed somehow. But prison is different from the real world. You can act like a model prisoner in prison, but as soon as you leave it, you're in the re- you're in a different world now. Mm-hmm. Circumstances are different. The problem is, if he was sentenced to ten years and only served like I don't know seven while that still sucks i mean it's that's that's at least seven years a majority of the time he was sentenced to 70 seven zero 70 years in prison and only served 10 that's it that's infuriating yeah oh wait there's more well and and also like yes i believe that people can be rehabilitated but i'm sorry but if you if you kill your own baby in that fashion there's Mm -hmm. no rehabilitating there's none disagree with me all you want i don't care there's none there wasn't for him no and you need to be put away for the rest of your fucking life just wait you're gonna get more pissed okay so while he was actually supposed to stay in texas while on parole because you know that's kind of what you're supposed to do no because he went back to the lake elsinore area in california after he was released from prison so he basically started a whole new life once he got back great everybody who knew him and became acquainted with him said that he he was super nice and he was so helpful oh i'm sure oh my gosh so helpful neighbors even let him babysit their kids because he was so helpful and so nice they thought he was just this mild-mannered nerd who wrote books and cookbooks in his spare time well, I mean, look at Ed Gein. They're like, yeah, I mean, he's a little odd, but he's harmless. Yeah, let's let him babysit our kids. Yep. Yep. So his chili recipe won him a chili cook-off even. Wow. Great this guy. Is how, this is how I found out about him, though. This, this, little, this little rumor here. It was rumored that he used the breast milk or the cut-off breast of one of his victims in this particular prize-winning chili. Oh my God. Yep. That kind of reminds me of Robert Pickman. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's actually how I found out about this guy. There was just some random fact on something that I saw that he, that was a rumor. It's never been confirmed that he used breast milk or the cutoff breast of one of his victims in that chili. The one that won him like first place. That's rough. Yeah. Yep. So he started working as a stock clerk in October of 1986 and participated in the company carpool. Because again, he's just super nice. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. Yep. So while he was not outspoken about his opinions on many things, the one opinion that he voiced was that of prostitution. He made it very clear that he hated them and thought they were a stain on society. Yikes. There was even something that said that some of his neighbors kids they would like come up to him they were like dressed up as barbie dolls or something like that and they were like oh what do you think of our outfits our costumes and he was like you look like prostitutes or you know something along those lines where he was like to children to children you know he's you know but he's this harmless nerd that he we're okay with him watching our kids you know that he was also super nice about gifting things to people you know like the clothing and purses and shoes of his victims oh yuck this is how he this is how one of them their their shoe fibers the victim's shoe fibers was found at the scene Mm -hmm. they figured out it's from her shoes because 
he gave those shoes to one of his co-workers as a gift yep that's a weird gift regardless Mm -hmm. yep also he had tried to give his wife at the time because he got married again i'll talk about that in a second okay he tried to give her a purse from one of the victims and she was like no thanks so instead he gave it to one of his neighbors and said hey this is one of my wife's purses she doesn't want any more so i'm gonna go ahead and give this to you yeah he's a great guy so speaking of his wife in 1990 you know the year before he was caught Mm -hmm. about a year in a month before he was caught he met his second wife cheryl in a supermarket where she had worked in just a few months they were married you Mm -hmm. know the gross part is he was 40 she was 18 so he fell immediately back into his controlling manipulative ways once they got married just like he did with terrell now love has no age but i think that's gross <laughs> that she's a teenager yep vomit yep. in july of 1991 their daughter bridget was born no apparently nobody and this included his new wife knew about his past in texas with his first daughter but history repeats itself because in october of 1991 remember she was born in what did i say july of 1991 so she's approximately three months old three month old bridget suffers brain damage and other injuries from apparent beating she survived but she was removed from the home nobody was convicted of that Nobody was convicted. Nobody was charged. January of 1992, when he was arrested, uh-huh. um, his new wife, Cheryl, she never actually tried to contact him or see him at all. And he saw this as a huge betrayal because, you know, he's the man and she should do everything that he wants and didn't, you know, all of that. Please stuff. tell me that she at least stopped talking to him after their daughter was taken away. <laughs> she stayed married to him. Okay. that was october okay <laughs> and this wasn't until january okay so mm-hmm. so he denied anything about any of the murders denied 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 so when he was questioned about kasari's murder when he was arrested because that was immediately the one that they kind of got him for kasari's was the first one that they were really pinning on him because it was the most recent plus the knife that they found in his van the blood and the pink substance both matched Eleanor Casares. So he said he was in the orange grove picking oranges and he found a body with a knife in it. So what he did was he pulled the knife out. That's why it was in his truck. No, no, dude. No. When you find a body with a knife in it, you just pull the knife out. What? That's no. the worst excuse. That's 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 the worst lie I've ever heard. Well, I found this dead body and I took the knife. That's why it's <laughs> from in my, the that's, body. That's why it's in my van. That's yeah. That's literally the worst lie I've ever heard. Worst. Yep, worst. But then he went on to say, but but I didn't cut her breast off. Kay. They hadn't even mentioned they hadn't even mentioned the breast. Hadn't Kay. mentioned it. He just offered up that just offered up the info i didn't do that though yeah (laughs) so he also has proclaimed his innocence throughout his trial he's never given any confession to any of this he was even quoted during his sentencing this was you know because again the jury only took 10 minutes to deliberate yeah he he was quoted as saying very quick for 12 murders well that's that's one of the quickest that i've ever heard yeah 10 minutes 10 minutes bananas guilty 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 good so he was quoted as saying prosecutor zellerbach who was obviously the prosecutor prosecutor zellerbach and the news media have all painted a grotesque picture of me as a cold-blooded heartless monster Uh uh-huh they they couldn't have been more wrong about me I am a caring, loving, and helpful person. Ask anyone who was close to me. Dude, you make me sick. You make me sick. I want to punch him in the fucking face. Uh (sighs) Uh-huh. 
he is still currently on death row in San Quentin State Prison in California. He was his last appeal was denied in 2014, and he has still proclaimed his innocence to this day. I looked him up, San Quentin Prison in California. He is there on death row. That's north, isn't it? I don't know. San Quentin. <laughs> Page. Sure. So he's been on death row for 25 years. Yeah, that's that's in the bay. There you go. That motherfucker is still alive. Have they done have they done DNA testing? For what? All the shit they kept found, finding. Founding. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's why I said they found the killer, William Suff. They found his hair and pubic hair at the crime scenes. And the male DNA that they found from the vaginal swabs was his. Because he consequently raped and then strangled and then stabbed his victims. I would say there was definitely a pattern there. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and he would do the same things, but in different orders on the different women. Some of them were stabbed in the chest and they were all very central, honestly. He was meaning to stab their heart. Mm -hmm. Asphyxiation, almost all of them were strangled. Yeah. And almost all of them had other marks on their bodies as well yeah. other than just the stab wounds and then the ligature marks yeah but see this is why i had to give you all of his victims first because i couldn't start off with dejeuner i couldn't start off with that I, I had to start off with that and then end with that motherfucker those women could still be alive to this day had he been kept in prison like he should have been is that the main reason because he was a model prisoner yeah was and there- of course you go up to the parole board he, you know however many times you can talk to the parole board yeah wait, wait wait did you read the sentencing as in like you will be eligible for parole after x amount of years no you didn't see anything like that because that might have been that might have been part of his sentence that he was up for parole after x amount of years and then judging on whatever then you can be let out so if that's the case then i think the judge who made that decision i think that was a very poor decision on that judge should not have happened yeah because again had he been kept in prison like he should have been yeah those women could still be alive exactly all 12 of them and let's face it there's probably more and possibly no they they said it was there was a straight like up to like 22 women were killed in this type of way but he was only charged with 14 of them plus the one attempted Mm -hmm. and then convicted of 12 and one attempted yeah (sighs) so basically as soon as he was done with his parole because his parole violation was one of the first reasons why he was technically arrested when he was because he hadn't checked in with his parole people in Texas. Did you, do you have anything from like the police's perspective, like anything about the investigation of these women? Um, actually all of this information I found from his 2014 appeal denial. Oh, all of the details and information I read almost all of his appeal denial and that's where I got all of that. There was so much more to it too, but DNA I had to lie, sir. <laughs> right. An- another thing that I had heard about as well and read about is the lead investigator or one of the lead investigators. She ended up being basically fired a few years after, I guess he was either found or convicted. I didn't get an exact timeline because I don't want to say bribery, but, and I don't really want to say theft, but kind of, I guess stuff was missing from evidence and I don't know. There was some shady shit going on with her not like on these cases, but for other stuff she ended up getting let go i didn't want to get into that crap but it was also mentioned in the appeal that was it was mentioned oh i get you so but that investigator was interviewed in that documentary i watched 
you gotta watch that it's, it's pretty interesting now were they actually like avidly looking for somebody because i'm gonna say right now i give mad props to sex workers because that is a dangerous job yeah it is so dangerous and yeah and it's really unfortunate because to a lot of people they're considered like quote unquote like less dead Mm -hmm. well and that was the other thing he considered them a thing he didn't consider them people he considered them things to throw away yeah they're not they're not people yeah they're not they're not people they could be bought so therefore they could also be thrown away that's and that's and that's really unfortunate because i've also seen in a lot of and i'm not i'm not calling out any police department in particular because it's happened a lot of places like if there's a sex worker that goes missing well maybe she packed up and left who knows they don't really they don't really look that hard into it and that's really unfortunate because like i said sex work is it's very dangerous because especially especially in those days when you're walking up to a vehicle you don't know what you're getting yourself into nope so well it's it's not that they had suspects but they were they had lots of information basically on this guy they knew he was in a van that multiple people had seen a gray or silver van Mm -hmm. they couldn't decide on the type of van though some people said astro van some people said you know some other thing but they could they all agreed that was this gray silver van and then the one that really gave the best description was kelly white cloud she's the one that saw her friend kelly hammond well she originally was the one to get in the van with this guy he bought her mcdonald's he wanted to take her out in the middle of nowhere she was like no hotel she 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 was totally creeped out by him yeah yeah another thing that she had noticed in the van was what looked like a bible on a center console turns out it's actually some kind of notebook or planner or something like that that basically had a picture of the bible on top of it so that's the other thing that tied him to that as well Mm, okay so but again to this day he's denying 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 dna doesn't lie though it really doesn't no unless you're you have a very terrible twin (laughs) evil twin yeah unless you have an evil twin no not yeah. at all that's bananas yeah. so did you know who this guy was had you heard of him i've heard the name but william. i didn't actually know his entire case william fucking suff the riverside prostitute killer yeah i might cut this out but getting into true crime more i've definitely realized that there's a lot of strangulation in california yeah 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 a a lot of them like that's like their their mo that was his that that's the one thing that all of them had in common even with Rhonda jetmore the very first one the one he got attempted murder for even with her well i'm i'm glad i'm glad that he got attempted murder for her too oh absolutely and i'm glad that she's a badass and was able to actually fight him off Rhonda is absolutely a badass Yeah. yeah And we're going to we're going to leave a list of the names of the women who passed in our description. Absolutely. Just like just Absolutely. like with just like with um uh Seth Provecki, I I left all the names of the family members that lost their lives and I'm going to do the same with all these women. Absolutely, so. cuz they deserve it. Yeah. They did actually one of suspect that they had thought of was a truck driver from like the Midwest. I think like Ohio-ish. So the lead investigator even like drove all the way to Ohio or flew or whatever she did to Ohio to try to get this guy and it ended up obviously ended up being a dead end. But yeah, so like they were active. Well, she definitely was actively trying to find this guy, but hmm. ultimately it I ended gotcha. up being that motorcycle officer pulled him over for a random thing. Very Ted Bundy esque. It's it's also very irritating. There's been a lot of killers that have been like caught for little reasons like that thank goodness but the dude didn't signal at a red light (laughs) that's why he was pulled over yeah like a dumbass i like ted bundy too well i'm telling you and also like um joel rifkin 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joe Ruffin got caught in a similar fashion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, how was that wild ride there? It's a little bonkers. I told you I'd piss you off are, at the end. Those are, there's a very violent and sick. Very violent. And you can definitely, you can definitely tell from when he started just the descriptions. Like mm-hmm. he definitely had his process as mm-hmm. to what he did. But when he started posing them and then mm-hmm. like the couple that he cut off their breasts. Yep. That, yeah. It's very, you could tell he was starting to uh, really get in his groove vomit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you for joining us this week on 2K Away. <laughs> on this very wild ride. Yeah. Hey, I gave you a solved one. Thank you. Finally, we have a conviction. <laughs> we have a conviction. While he's still on death row, yeah. we have a conviction At in, least a pr- in a person he's in prison. in prison where he needs to be yep 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 good all right so you can follow us on facebook at 2k away and you can follow us on instagram at 2k away podcast and we do have a youtube channel where you can see our beautiful kind of faces (laughs) wait wait there it we have kind of faces they're not like real faces yep that's what i meant by that not kind of beautiful they're they're kind of faces (laughs) at least they're beautiful well like i said in our lizzie borden episode we're the prettiest pigs in the pig pen (laughs) yep that's who we are but yeah we do have a youtube channel it is 2k way podcast and i've been saying it for the last few weeks we will be having a patreon soon i promise (laughs) um it's just i'm i'm kind of i'm going to probably wait until after uh, um after december because we have some things coming up in december that we have planned and i want to wait until then so yeah we will see all righty thank you for joining us and we will see you all in the next one bye bye